Another key word in statistics is independence. Um, but it actually has multiple meanings. So you're going to have to talk about several meanings of independence. Um, I'm listing them here, but we're going to talk about them. So I won't give you the mini potted uh, meaning of each because we're going to get them. But we can talk about independence of measurement, which is um, probably should say the normal, the most common use of the word independent, but also two other things about factor effects and sample prevalence. Crucially, non-independence, when things aren't independent, and we'll sort of come about what that means in these different ways, it increases variability. Sometimes it can create bias as well, but the, the big effect of non-independence is often to change variability and typically to increase it. And we'll explain why that happens in a bit. Um, so the first kind of measurement, which is the main, was about independence of measurements. Um, so I am, for instance, we're you know, doing our coin tossing. Every time you toss a, toss a coin, um, you don't ex you expect the fact that I've tossed it once and got ahead this time doesn't make any difference when I toss it the next time, whether it be a head or a tail. And one of the fallacies, in fact, and people often think, is if you if you had a lot of heads, surely the tail is going to come. And um, this is one of the ways in which uh, gamblers often end up losing money because they think, oh, I've lost lots of times. Surely my luck's going to come to me, as if there was this fixed pool of it. But in fact, when you do a lot of things like tossing, tossing coins every time makes no difference to the next one. However, that's not always the case. And, and you have more complex phenomena, that's not. So for instance, if you're running an experiment with users and you, you use one system and then you use another, there's often some relationship. So if people enjoyed one system, they might be feeling a good mood when they get the next one, or actually they might think the next one's rubbish because it wasn't as good as the first one. But you get some sort of interactions going on. Um, or, you know, people learn things. So if you do have several teaching systems, then by the end, people are going to be better than the beginning because they've learned all the way through them. So there, if you take measurements of the same, same person, sometimes you, you get effects that are related to each other. Um, I have had day effects. Uh, I mean, this is in, I mean, it's use, usability. We understand that people are complex, but actually on physical data, I was once measuring drop sizes. So sprays, uh, uh, agricultural sprays, spray drops, measuring the sizes. We got some weird effect. We've been doing some experiments, got a weird effect. Um, and suddenly realised that we'd not taken into account, or there was no reason why I should take into account that we'd done the experiments over two days. We, we put that in as a factor into our analysis, read it the analysis, and everything disappeared. And all the weird, well, certainly all the weird effects disappeared. And for some reason, there was something that was different from two days. We tried to set the experiments up the same. This is physical materials. It's not the fact that you came in with a good mood and talked differently to your users one day than another. Um, now, if that can happen to physical materials, just think how easy that can happen with your users. And I said, particularly if you are talking to your users, if you're in a good mood one day, you might end up with lots of good results in your experiments because you've put your users into a good mood. If you're bad mood the next day, it might not be. So you can get weird effects like that. Um, all of these things tend to increase variability. So they can, they can create bias. So for instance, if you ex do lots of experiments with system with your with one system on the first day when you happen to be in a good mood and you're talking to them and you're you're lots of smiles and the next day you're in a bad mood you're not lots of time you're testing a different system then you will create a bias they're more likely to have a negative uh, view of the second system than the first system because you've influenced them what you should do with these kinds of experiments is always try to, as po as far as possible, mitigate those effects. So, for instance, the first day you do a mix of system one and system two, the second day you do a mixture. You try to, to, to reduce those effects. But what you probably will do is increase variability because you've, you've, in, you've added some factor that makes things different. So often when you have order effects, uh, when you have uh, experiment effects, if you spend enough time, if you do enough things, you, you can get rid of them. Um, sometimes they do increase bias, but you certainly increase variability. Um, in fact, this is particularly obvious for the order effects with coins. And um, if imagine uh, when you tossed a coin, it somehow was connected with an elastic band to the next one. So the fact that one was ahead meant the next one was likely to be ahead. Then runs of heads, lots of heads like this, would be, it would suddenly become very common. And I'll show you some software you can experiment about this in another video. Um, another kind of independence is um, 
when the things you're measuring in some way are uh, correlated or relation uh, related to each other um so classic one would be um this isn't a usability one but in hospitals so you measure it and you find that specialist hospitals have um a high death rate Ooh. you know so don't go to a specialist hospital go to the little cottage hospital down the road don't go to the special it's a death rate high of course why do people go to specialist hospitals? Because they've got things wrong with them and things that are difficult that aren't dealt with well by less specialist hospitals. So there's two effects that somehow relate to each other. So you, if, you're, if you're not careful, you say, aha, death rate higher in specialist hospitals. But actually, the kinds of patients who are in specialist hospitals are related and they are not typical patients and it's, it's it's not an unusual thing to have so um if you've chosen lots of users and then you randomly allocate them to two systems then hopefully you don't get this kind of effect um but if you have something that is making you choose users for one system rather, rather than another perhaps based on um what they what software they've used already or something like that it's easy for there to be other factors that you're you're missing um this can actually sometimes even completely reverse the effects and there's things called simpson's paradox where this happens so i'll give you an educational example for this one so imagine you're running a, a, a course and um, perhaps a course on statistics or a course on usability or user experience design um, and you've got some full-time students and some part-time students and you've been doing your stats year by year to see whether you're improving the way you teach it and stuff. And you've worked out that your full-time students are getting better year on year. Yay! And you also check your part-time students. And then you find on average they're getting better year, year by year. Yay, you're doing well. And then you get the letter from the university, uh, from the rector or whatever, who says, oh, your students seem to be getting worse. What's going on with your teaching? Mm. You measured them going up. The university says they're going down. What's going on? Um, which one of you is right? In fact, you might both be right. So um, here's some data, right? So, um, well, I perhaps should be doing this bit by bit. So what I'm going to do is focus on here's the um, you've got the part the full-time students is the top row and the part-time students over two years. So if you look at the full-time students, right? Um, in 2015, they got 75 marks on average. Um, in 2016, they got 80 marks on average, and that's my um, blue line, which goes up there. Um, if I look at the, um, oops, sorry, but um, so they, they appear to go, but if you look at the average mark at the bottom, the very bottom line, the average overall mark is 70 for the uh, average student and 65. So if you look at the pop, the full-time students on their own, the top row, they get better, 75 to 80. If you look at the part-time student average, they get better from 55 to 60. That's the blue and the red lines. If you look at the overall average at the bottom, it goes down from 70 to 65. That's the green line. What? The answer is if you look at the kinds of students. So like in 2015, so the number of full-time students hasn't changed. There's 30 students both years. But you, for whatever reason, perhaps there's been a change in government policy in the way your university has been advertising. But Or perhaps you've done something to yourselves. But anyway, your number of part-time students has gone up from 10 to 90. And on average, the part-time students were doing less well than full-time students. That's not uncommon because people are trying to mix with their jobs or whatever. Um, so the number of part-time students increased therefore your average mark decreased. So although the part-time students increased, the full-time students increased, the overall average went down. Um, now, I mean, you want to know this. You want to answer back to your rector to tell them, no, you aren't really doing worse. Um, but I said it is possible to actually um, have those, those sort of effects. And that's because the... Um, here, the years, 2015 versus 2016, is not independent of the kind of sample. And the way you've sampled has effectively varied for each year. One, it was a sample, in some sense, this theoretical set of parts of full-time, part-time students. We had 30 full-time and 10 part-time. And the other was there was 30 full-time and 90 part-time. And the scores were not, were related to that part-time and full-time nature. Um, 
So, you know, this is the independence. The way you obtain your sample can change the kind of results you got. It's not, they're not independent. Um, sometimes the subjects also might be related to one another. There might be some sort of internal um, lack of independence within samples. Um, snowball sampling is a common technique used so that what what you do with snowballing is you ring, you know, you have your friends or people you've got or people who've used your software who have expressed interest in your software, pop their cards in when you've been at the big trade exposition. Um, you ring them up and you get, I'll say, can you do our survey? And then you ask them if they've got anybody they know who'd like to do the survey as well. And then they get their friends and you you go out. Um, of course, if you start off with a kind of person who likes one thing, then it's quite possible their friends will. I mean, imagine this for political uh, political poll. You, um, you ask your Democrat friend what they're gonna vote and they tell you, what they're going to vote you get them to ask their friends and they're quite likely to be democrats as well so there's this tendency when you do snowball sampling to sort of have the same kind of people now if you do enough of it eventually you'll jump into a different area and suddenly so again if you're doing the opinion uh, poll testing you do your democrat sampling and eventually one of your democrats will have a republican as a friend and then pop, you've got a set of um, Republicans coming out. So if you do it enough, you can you can get to them, but it's increased your variance. It's made it more likely you'll have something. And that if it's a small sample, you could well create a particular bias. Um, and sometimes it's, but sometimes it's external. So that's about internal variance within the samples. Um, this is going back to our Snapchat versus LinkedIn. Sometimes it's about the way the subject you're choosing relates to the sort of topic you're interested in. So if you, um, did a mobile app sur sur survey and decided to try and work out the age of the population by um, looking at the age of the people who used your app, you'll get a very different answer if it's Snapchat versus LinkedIn. You know, So the kind of sa sample you did, the way you created the sample created an effect, which there is a bias effect. So internal um, uh, relationships where one person is related to the next if you do it enough, you tend to sort of get, you get uh, an unbiased effect in one sense, but for the variability increases, the likelihood that sometimes you'll do it and you'll get one result, sometimes you'll do it, you'll get a completely different result. Um, if you do enough, a big enough sample, again, it goes away, just like a lot of variability effects. This external one where there's some sort of correlation relationship between the kinds of people who've chosen and the kinds of things you're measuring, that doesn't go away, so that's much, much more serious. So the crucial question to ask, and this is related to all of these kinds of independence, is when you're doing your survey, when you're doing your experiment and you've chosen particularly people to come in and perhaps do a user study, a user experience study, um, is the way you've organised your sample likely to be independent of the kind of measurement you're making? So it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily, you don't have to have something that's um, perfect and absolutely unrelated to anything. But if there's a, if the way you've done it is likely to have an effect on the kind of measurement you're making, and if it is, then you have to deal with it. You either have to remove that effect or you have to try and again model it and, and deal with it that way. Um, so for instance, you know, you, you might do something like Fitz Law with different colored targets. Do you think the color matters, you know? Um, Ask people, you know, if all the close targets are red and all the far ones are green, is that going to make any difference or not? Um, if you're um, using students to, uh, which again, very common thing to do in certainly in academic studies, um, or perhaps you're using your colleagues to test something in, a, in an industrial setting, are they likely, to, uh, for whatever you're trying to measure, to be similar to who you're after. So if you're going to be distributing your software to lots and lots of people, are they likely to be similar to the, the people you're measuring? Uh, for what matters? Now, they might be different in all sorts of other ways, but for what matters for you, for your enjoyment of the software, for the difficulty of it, are the people you're actually looking at likely to be the same or different from the ones in general? If the answer is they're different, then you have a problem and you have to deal with it.